So g'day and welcome to the channel. Over the last 11 years, I have made just about every mistake there is to make in regards to wildlife photography. From stuffing up my exposure, buying useless gear, you name the mistake, I've done it. Today's video, I'm gonna share with you all the common mistakes that I made so you don't have to make them yourself. I want you to go out there with a head start and just enjoy your wildlife photography as much as I do. Quickly wanna thank all my subscribers who let me know their mistakes. I'm glad to know I'm not the only one. And if you've made mistakes, I'd love you to leave them in the comments so we can all learn from them. I'm gonna break it down into gear mistakes and technique mistakes. The first thing I wanna cover though is the gear. And this one is really, really important. You do not need expensive gear to enjoy wildlife photography. You don't need this 500 F4, the R7, you don't need to spend thousands. It helps and there's a reason for this gear, but you don't need it to enjoy wildlife photography. In fact, when I started, I actually started with this 40D, which is 2007, I think. It's worth about $40 secondhand. And I had this really awesome lens, the Canon 405.6, which I really, really love. It's around 600. So for around 650 US, you can get out there and take some cracking shots. I actually went back through my catalog and here's one of the very first shots I ever took with this kit. I think it was January, 2012, 10 years ago. These pied oyster catchers love this shot. I love the behavior. I love the birds chasing each other. I love all those birds in the background. And that was taken with this affordable kit. So you can definitely get nice shots with old gear. So the key is to understand how to take a good photo and it's the person behind the camera which decides how to do that. So what we need to do is learn how to take good shots and this video will help you get out into the field and take good shots with whatever gear you have. So the first big mistake I made was actually using a UV filter in front of my lens. When I used the cheap UV filter, it created these weird lines in my images that you can see, and the image quality just wasn't quite right. I took the UV filter off, and like magic, the images improved. Now, I know many of you are scared of scratching your front element, and that's fair enough. I just use lens hoods. I've never used any sort of filters. If you are gonna use a filter, I highly encourage you to buy an expensive one, because you wanna put good glass in front of these proper lenses. So. If you're having odd things in your images, perhaps take the UV filter off and test for yourself. Another big mistake we all make is we start in JPEG. So on the camera, we can select JPEG or RAW. And for ease of use, most of us just shoot in JPEG because RAW seems too difficult. And that is a big mistake because those RAW files will capture way more details. You can change the white balance, you can recover shadows, you can recover blown highlights. RAW files have so much more data, you're just doing yourself a disservice if you shoot in JPEG only. So let's have a look at this example. Here's a shot I took of a jabiru or a black neck stalk. And as you can see, I had a real challenge here because the sun was in the shot, so we had a bright sky. I've underexposed it to try to protect those highlights, but now the bird is almost black and it's dark and we can't really see anything. But because I shot in RAW, I can go into a RAW converter like Adobe, I can increase the shadows, I can play around and we can actually recover a lot of the detail. And here's the final shot that I took because I shot in RAW. So with RAW, we have so much more flexibility and versatility to save the images in the editing process. And that probably brings us to another mistake, is not investing enough time in the editing process, learning how to convert RAW files, learning how to recover shadows and highlights and cropping and all these sorts of things. Now, it took me a long time and it does take some time. I use Adobe Lightroom myself. I did a video on my conversion process, which you're free to check out. I highly encourage you to invest some time in editing because it's important part in that digital workflow. To get the best out of your images, you really need to edit them properly. So the next mistake we often make is we don't actually shoot in high burst rate. What I mean by high burst rate is when we hold down the shutter of our cameras, we can either take one photo at a time or we can take photos continuously. And the rate at which we take those photos is called our FPS or our frames per second. And each camera will be different. This R7 can believe it or not go up to 30 frames per second. So when I hold down the shutter, this camera is gonna take 30 photos in a row continuously until I stop. So let's have a listen to what that sounds like. At a lot of frames, it's literally 30 frames a second. Now, if we go back to my old 40D, um, I believe this is six and a half frames per second, so much slower. Let's see what that sounds like. So the advantage to this camera is it's obviously gonna capture those moments. So we might have a bird flying like this soft crested cockatoo that I captured. This was on the R5, so 20 frames per second. You can see we just got lots of frames and I was able to get one frame where the bird was looking at me. Everything was perfect. Now it's highly unlikely I would have got that shot with this one at six and a half frames per second because it's just too slow and I likely would have missed the action. So the higher the frame rate, the more likely you are to capture that moment. That's why we like high frame rates. However, 
there is a downside to shooting with these high frame rates is that is at 30 frames per second you just take way too many photos to begin with and you also have an issue with the buffer um, so the buffer on the camera is how many images it can store so let's have a listen to what happens how quickly this goes to the buffer so this is on the r7 30 frames per second in raw so just over a second or two and then it just stops taking photos and that's not ideal so what we can do is we can actually adjust the um, we can change the speed at what we shoot at so I can actually go from 30 frames per second to 15 frames per second and so that's our, now going to take less photos so my buffer will be longer and there's a technique that you should try yourself and that's called feathering when we say feathering what we mean is instead of just holding down the shutter like this and then you'll hit the buffer if you just take lots of short bursts so we feather the shutter so we're, we're shooting So if we just take lots of little bursts, we're not going to fill up the buffer as quickly, meaning we can shoot for longer periods before the buffer stops. So that's what I do in the field. Sometimes you just get excited and hold it down or something's happening. But generally I'll be I'll shooting and I'm just shooting in bursts. And that's all I'm sort of doing. So I highly encourage you to try and practice that feathering the shutter so that you don't hit your buffer as quickly as you would just holding down the button. So the speed at which your camera clears its buffer, so it's only got that limited amount of internal memory, and unfortunately some of these Canons are pretty poor. So how do we actually make it faster? Well, it comes down to the speed of the memory card in your camera. So your camera is madly trying to write the photos to your memory card, and it's, each card will have a different speed. And what's important to understand is that the cards will have a read speed and a write speed and they're a little bit sneaky these manufacturers because what they often do is they will show you the uh, read speed and not the write speed so I'll just quickly show you so this prograde card here it says it's 250 megabytes per second this actually only has a write speed of 130 so it's significantly slower than the read speed and it's the write speed that we're interested in now of here is one of their other cards which is actually quite a bit faster and you can see that it actually has a write speed of 250 megabytes per second so it's much much faster so there are different speeds out there and it's important that you understand those different speeds and if you can afford it we need to get the faster speed because that's going to enable you to take more photos i did a quick test on this r7 to see how many shots we could take in 30 seconds with the different speed cards i started with the 70 megabyte sandisk a really really old card and over 30 seconds i managed to get 66 shots which is not a lot and then i changed it to the faster prograde the 250 megabyte per second and i got way more i got 156 shots in the same amount of time so it's interesting to see that an old card only took 66 whereas the new one took 156 so a big difference and that's one of the reasons why we need to invest in these cards and i guess that's another big mistake when we start we often want to save our money and we get the smaller cheaper card so i definitely did this and have a look how many cards i went through until i finally spent the money and bought the big 128 gigabyte card and the problem is i don't use those smaller slower cards so i actually probably ended up spending more money what i should have done is just i didn't have the money at the time but what i should have probably done is just bought the expensive card to start with so my advice would be to get the biggest and fastest cards that you can afford as a bare minimum i reckon 128 gigabytes for wildlife and at minimum 120 megabytes per second um, write speed ideally you want to get that faster write speed the 250 at least and the bigger card to help you with that purchase prograde have actually offered all my beautiful subscribers and viewers a 15 percent off discount at amazon.com so the us.com store if you go down to the description there'll be a link and there'll be a code to give you 15 percent off those great prograde cards Okay, so the next common mistake is actually not shooting in continuous autofocus mode. Now, I know autofocus is a little bit confusing, but most cameras allow you to shoot in single shot or one shot. That is when we aim at something, we hold down the focus button, it'll focus on the subject, it'll often give us a beep to tell us it's in focus, we take the photo. Now, what happens is if that subject moves closer or it moves and we move the camera, we have to manually refocus every time onto that subject so if it moves and you don't refocus it'll be out of focus so we need some way to track we need some way for the autofocus to track our subject and thankfully all these modern cameras have a continuous autofocus mode i think on sony and nikon it's called afc and on canon it's ai servo so if you put it into ai servo your camera is going to try to automatically track the subject i can do a quick demonstration on gary the galah if I'm in one shot, I put it onto the glass, I focus, it's in focus, it beeps, and I get the photo. But when I now move to the owl, 
the camera doesn't focus on it until I manually hit the focus button and it focuses. Now if I switch it into AI server or tracking mode, I put it onto the galah, it focuses, I now move the camera onto the owl and it automatically changes subject. Now what you'll see with these modern mirrorless cameras, they have an advanced tracking autofocus system called eye tracking where magically it just finds the eye of the bird and it tracks it as the bird moves. So it's continually focusing all the time. It's not perfect, you do sometimes get a bit of hunting and a bit of jumping, but it works very well. And for bird and flight and that sort of thing, it's a bit of a game changer. All right, so we're getting through them. The next one, and it's a very common mistake, is we just put uh, our camera onto P, which stands for full auto, and we take photos, and we don't have any control over our exposure, and that is a mistake for wildlife, because we need to control the shutter speed. We need to have an idea of how those settings are influencing our photo. And I have done a video on exposure and settings and things you're free to check out. This is probably where you need to spend a lot of time at the start is to figure out what this all means, how to get exposures and how it all works. Shutter speed is the most important because it's our shutter speed that ultimately dictates how many sharp shots we get and whether we get blur or movement in our photo. So very, very quickly with the shutter speed, basically there's light traveling down our lens and the camera sensor needs a certain amount of light to expose the photo. And the amount of time that it has to gather that light is our shutter speed. So if we had a one second shutter speed, it's gonna be open for one second, that's one second worth of light. And the faster we go, so say we had one one thousandth of a second, which is really fast, it's only getting a little bit of light for a very short amount of time. And you can think logically, if you had a second, if there's something moving in that second, it's gonna be blurry in your photo. However, if it's one one hundredth of a second, you're almost freezing the action, freezing time, so it's less likely to be blurry. Now, the big difference between wildlife and say landscapes and any other form of photography is we generally need really high shutter speeds to freeze the action. One four hundredth of a second to me is actually slow. I know that probably sounds fast to many others, but ideally you wanna to try to keep your shutter speed above one four hundredth of a second to reduce motion blur and camera shake. Because when we're holding these lenses, especially the big ones, we move a lot and I shake a lot. So if I'm holding this lens and I'm trying to take photos, any slight movement on my part is likely to incur some sort of motion blur. And if the bird moves, we've then got another issue. So just to demonstrate this, I actually shot a white fronted chat at one one hundredth of a second, which is really slow. And as I hit the shutter, the bird's actually moved its head. And you can see it's captured that movement because the shutter speed was too slow. So I was unable to get a shot. Thankfully, the bird stayed still and I did get one at one one hundredth. Pretty cool that I managed to get that shot. And the reason we can use a slower shutter speed, such as one one hundredth, if you have to, is these modern cameras have IBIS, they have image stabilization in the lens, which actually counteracts a lot of that blur and enables you to take and use much slower shutter speeds. So my old 405.6 that I showed before does not have IS, so I have to use higher shutter speeds on that. So if you have an older lens without IS or a camera without IBIS, you'll often have to use higher shutter speeds to keep your keeper rate up. It all comes down to your keeper rate. Like if you shoot at low shutter speeds, you might get 10 out of 100 shots sharp. Whereas if you uh, shoot at higher shutter speeds, you might get 60 to 80 sh shots sharp. So your shutter speed dictates your keeper rate and how much movement you're gonna capture. I know that's confusing, I know that's a lot, but we need to be able to control it. So now you might be thinking, oh cool, that's pretty simple. I'll just set my camera to one one thousandth of a second, nice and fast, I'm never gonna have motion blur, and it's happy days. What you'll quickly find out is if you set it at one one thousandth, you're either gonna have a very dark photo or you're gonna have a lot of noise because your camera needs light. And if you don't have light, so say it's overcast and you set one one thousandth of a second, the camera just literally doesn't have enough light to expose the photo. So as you can see here in this shot taken at one one thousandth of a second, it's pretty much almost completely black or dark. That's because there wasn't enough light to expose the photo. So we've taken the photo, but there wasn't enough light to expose it. So what do we do in that circumstance? We've got an issue. That's where your ISO comes into play. Your ISO determines how sensitive, it's like a quality setting, I suppose. So the lower that number, so ISO 100 is the highest quality setting. It needs the most amount of light. As we start bumping that up, it actually needs less light to expose the photo. It's just, as I increase the ISO, you can see that the image starts getting brighter and brighter until we get a correct exposure. The problem with using such a high ISO now is that you're gonna have way more noise and you're not gonna have as much image quality. And that brings us to the wildlife photographer's dilemma. Do we use high shutter speeds and high ISO, so sort of poor quality, or do we use really low shutter speeds and low ISO to keep the image quality up? And I can't answer that for you, and it is a real drama. 
and it's just something you have to be aware of. What I often do, and this is a tip, is I start with a higher shutter speed and a higher ISO because I want to make sure that the shot is sharp. If the bird stays there and I've managed to capture a few and I can check, yep, I've managed to nail a couple of shots, then I will lower the ISO, lower the shutter speed and try and take some more shots. And if I'm able to get shots at that lower shutter speed, then I'll keep those because they're generally higher quality. We've got uh, two different images here, one at a higher shutter speed and higher ISO and you can see that the other one has um, better quality. Now if you are shooting in an auto exposure mode such as auto ISO, your camera is actually going to automatically set the ISO for you. And you look on the camera and you go, why is my shot so noisy? Like why is there so much grain? It's generally because your shutter speed was too high because there wasn't enough light. So if you're getting lots and lots of noise in your images, you have to reduce that shutter speed. And unfortunately in low light, say you're in a forest or a jungle or whatever, there's no way around this. You have to use really low shutter speeds to try and keep that ISO in check. It's just something we have to put up with and be aware of. And that leads us on to the other part of the exposure triangle is the aperture. The aperture is the size of the blade inside the lens that lets the light in. You can restrict it or open it right up and your lens will have a maximum aperture. So this lens here is f4, which is actually lets in quite a lot of light. And I can stop that down to say 5.6, 6.3, 7.1, etc. A lot of older lenses were actually sharper stopped down. So the most common ones are like, say that Sigma 150 to 600 is 6.3. A lot of people will just shoot at 6.3. And I guess that's okay if you don't have a lot of light. However, if you do have a lot of light, maybe try shooting at F8. By doing that, some lenses are sharper um, stopped down and your depth of field will increase and often the images will just look slightly better. So if you have the light, maybe try F8, something like that, just to see how it impacts the sharpness of your images. So staying with exposure and settings, what I always do is I actually take test shots before the bird turns up. So when I'm jumping out of the truck or the car and before I even go for a walk, I'm actually setting the exposure, taking a test shot on a DSLR, I'm checking to see if there's any highlights blowing on the background, I'm checking my histogram on the back to make sure that when the bird does turn up, I'm ready to go and I'm not stuffing around with the settings. So I know we may have to adjust them as the light changes, but if you have your base settings that are right, you're gonna be far more likely to have the right ones when the bird turns up because the big mistake is the bird turns up and you're madly trying to take it and you overexpose or underexpose it. So always take test shots, always be taking photos and adjusting your exposure as you go. Okay, so whilst it's a lot easier to handhold your lens, what we often do is we buy heavy lenses like the Sigma 150-600 Sport, uh, the Sony 200-600, or even this big monster here. They're just too heavy to handhold for long, long periods because your arms are gonna get tired and you'll start shaking. As you start shaking, you're gonna get a lot more soft shots and motion blur, and I shake a lot. So what I do is I've actually bought a nice tripod, which is quite sturdy, and I use this thing called a gimbal, um, which you can mount your heavy lens on and you can move it around, and it just takes the weight. You don't have to carry it, and when you hold it, it's much more stable. So you're gonna get less motion blur and more sharp shots. You can use monopods. I've definitely done a review of a monopod. Whatever you find easiest, just be aware buying these big heavy lenses, there is that downside that you're gonna to have to have some sort of support. All right, so that leads us on to probably the most important thing that a beginner needs to understand, and that is the light. The light is everything with photography. The light will change and dictate the types of shots you get, the settings you use, and it's just incredible the variety of different shots we can take in different types of lighting. And I wanna show you some of my favorite shots taken in different lighting, so you have some understanding of what's possible. So the first shot I took was actually before the sun had even come up, we get these beautiful colors reflecting on the water, and I had took this red cap plover with this beautiful red background, and that was before the sun had even come up. 20 minutes later, the sun was now up and we're getting direct sunlight and you can see how different the shot is. So this is the same species, the same location. They look completely different because the light was now different. Now this direct sunlight that I have, this is often when you'll get the best details and the best focus because we've got lots of contrast and we've got lots of details, low ISO, high shutter speeds, enables you to get like these beautiful reflections. I took this shot of a redneck stint, one of my favorite shots I've ever taken, and this was in direct sunlight. But sometimes direct sunlight isn't what we want. Sometimes you may actually like overcast conditions because it creates like this big diffuser in the sky and you can take shots without heavy shadows. And I do this quite a bit and I got this Eastern Spinebill on this beautiful flower. That's nice overcast conditions. So they can definitely work in your favor. So whilst I take the majority of my shots with the sun behind me highlighting the bird, don't be afraid of trying different angles. Like side lighting can actually be quite cool sometimes. I took this black swan coming towards me. We can see the sun hitting the side of the bird, creating this 
interesting shot with interesting light. And we can also get very creative by putting the sun in front of us. So um, backlit subjects or creating silhouettes. And if you saw my last video, I managed to get one of my favorite shots I've taken of recent times. And that was the silhouette of these little black cormorants all in a row. It's just the color's great, the silhouette's great, it just works. And I also really love albatross flying in the sky with a beautiful colored background. It's unique, it's different, and this is because of where I was in position to the light. You can also play around with dappled light. So sometimes we get these nice colors dappled on the background in the morning, and I had this gray teal swimming, and we had these different colors. Again, that's something unique. Also, what sometimes happens is our subject is in the light, but the background is not, it's in shadow. What that tends to do is your background becomes very, very dark, but the subject is isolated and has the light and you can get some really cool shots. I got this Takahe in New Zealand and we can see the bird is just in this glorious sun, but the background's dark, it creates a unique photo. So another light that many people don't like is low light or in the forest, but these can create some really interesting shots. Me and a few mates ventured into a rainforest to photograph the amazing pink robin. We got the pink robin on this beautiful perch. We had the nice dark green background of the forest, just enabled us to create this sort of shot that I'm very, very happy with. Another type of light that I often shy away from is poor conditions, like when it's raining or the wind's blowing. You can actually get some very creative shots in these conditions. And this is one of my favorite ones. Me and a mate were in Tasmania and we were driving around and it was raining. We had a green rosella feeding on this uh, plant and you can see sort of the water droplets in the background. It created quite an interesting shot. And this other one that I took, I was lucky enough to go to the sub-Antarctic. It was wet, it was cold, it was miserable, but this little tomtit didn't care. It had caught a few grubs. It's sitting on one of these native giant cabbages and uh, the rain's coming in sideways. Just a great photo that I'm very happy that I took. As you can see from these collection of images, the light heavily influences the type of shots you can get. And I highly encourage you to go out in all sorts of types of light. Just have a play around, find what works for you. So if you're starting out, you're probably best shooting in direct sunlight and when you have ample light, because then you can use higher shutter speeds, lower ISO, your photos are gonna look better. And just to demonstrate this, I just recently took a few shots of an Azure Kingfisher and I took some in direct sunlight and I took some in shadow. And in shadow is often even harder than in low light. So we have just lack of light. And when we zoom in 100%, you can see the difference in quality between these two shots. Direct sunlight, plenty of contrast, plenty of detail. Whereas when we're in shadow, we get a lot more noise. We didn't have the same amount of light. The quality's just not quite the same. And it's something you need to be aware of. Okay, so probably one of the biggest mistakes beginners make is not understanding how the background influences your images. Most wildlife photographs you see will have this blurred background, the subject's isolated, and yet most beginners are going, how do they do that? I don't understand, I can't do that. And there's a few ways to do it, and we need to understand how your position, how far away you are, your aperture, your focal length, the isolation of the subject, how all these things go together to influence the photo, and it's really, really important. For example, these two shots of Rufus Field Wren were taken with the same camera, the same lens, the same location. The only difference was our distance to the subject. So you can see what a difference it makes. Just get closer to your subject and where the bird sits on that bush. And one of them, the background's completely out of focus, whereas the other one, it's not because the bird's just too far away. So the biggest tip there is we have to get close to our subject. So let's show you an example. We've placed a toy galah on an exposed rock and there's nothing directly behind the galah. And this is really, really important. So I'm around 10 meters or 32 feet from the subject. If I have a short focal length of say 100 millimeters, we get a big wide field of view. The bird's actually quite small and everything appears in focus because we have a large depth of field. Now, as I change that focal length and we get more and more focal length, if we get to say 500 millimeters, we can now see that the bird is much, much bigger. The background has been compressed and pulled in and now it looks a lot more out of focus. And now we're starting to get those shots that you see on social media. And that's because we had adequate focal length, our distance to the subject, and there's nothing directly behind the bird. So let's say you don't have 500 millimeters of focal length. Well, you need to get closer to the subject. And you can see how when we move closer to the glare, the glare gets bigger, the depth of field gets narrower, and the background goes out of focus more. So if we get closer, that's often the quickest and easiest way to blur that background and get that subject bigger. I know that's difficult and I know it's hard to get close to wildlife, but it's just something you need to understand. You can't be 50 meters away, take a photo and expect to get those sorts of shots. 
Now, one of the biggest tips I can give you is getting eye level with the bird. And you've probably heard this a few times. It is so important. And I can show you this quite easily with Gary the Galar. If I put him on a rock, focus down straight onto the ground, our background is now very, very close to the subject. Before it was further away, the ground is now right behind it. I take a photo, there's not enough space, so the background is now in focus. We've got a weird angle and it just doesn't quite look right. If I lower my position to get eye contact with Gary, the background is now further away and it goes out of focus. And this is really important for waterfowl, um, shorebirds. We can't stand up. I know some people are limited due to disability or age, and I respect that. If you can get down low, it's a great idea because with those water birds, etc., if our belly's on the ground and we're eye level, we're going to get much, much more intimate photos. The background's going to disappear. And that's how people get those shots. So I'm just letting you know that's how it's done. And often if we've got a bird in the tree and we're leaning back taking a photo, that angle is going to be a bit weird. It's just not going to be quite right. So if we can get eye level, it's really, really important. Now, it's not just up and down and getting eye level that we need to worry about. What we really need to consider is our movement. What happens when we are beginners is we get frozen in place. We see the subject. We stand there. We take some shots. We're really happy. And then we look at the photo. And we go, oh, I never noticed that tree coming through the bird's head or a dark patch or a bright spot and we could have simply just moved to our right or moved to our left and it could have completely changed the composition and the look of that image and you'll be surprised at a difference this make. Me and a mate had a chance to photograph a peregrine falcon, the peregrine was on the side of a cliff, we had a blue water background, it was fine, it was cool but we just simply moved to our left and all of a sudden the cliff then changed position and we had a cliff behind the bird, changed how it looks. So we now had two cool images of this bird, one with a water background, one with a cliff background. Whenever I'm taking photos, I'm constantly checking what does my background look like? Is there anything distracting? So that's sort of what I'm thinking, but I still get it wrong. Just last week, I was photographing this white fronted chat and I missed that the white dirt ground was in the right hand side of this image. And you can see how we have that bright distracting part. What I should have done is moved more to my right to get more of that plant in the shot. I mean, I can crop in to remove that white part, then, then that sort of brings me to the next mistake people make and they often crop too much. So what beginners will tend to do is we want the bird big so we just crop heavily. And when we crop heavily on the bird, we lose a lot of detail. And you can see with this white fronted chat, if I put it next to a shot that I got where I was much, much closer, we can see that the bigger bird has way more detail. The one that we didn't crop as much has more detail. And when we crop heavily, we introduce more noise because we're closer in. So there's gonna be more noise the more we crop, less detail. And I had did this all the time when I started is I just cropped as hard as I could to make the bird as big as possible. Just let it breathe. There's nothing wrong with a bit of habitat. There's nothing wrong with giving that bird a little bit of space. And actually, as I've progressed through my career, I actually now prefer more habitat than I used to. So <laughs> just something you'll go through through your journey is figuring these things out. Before we finish up on backgrounds, it's been a lot, I know, but it's important is where the bird sits itself or where the bird is positioned will drastically change how things look. So if we had Gary the Glar in the middle of a bush, for example, it doesn't matter how far away or how close I am, that bush is never gonna go out of focus because it's just too close to the bird. Now, if we waited and the bird jumped to an exposed rock or an exposed branch and the background was now further away, we now change the shot. So what I'm often doing in the bush is I'm waiting or stalking the bird until it gets itself into a position that enables us to get that shot. Another big mistake we make is underestimating how important the location is in getting good shots. Some locations are just way easier than others. And I have spent countless hours, I've failed numerous times going to spots which just are hopeless for bird photography. And unfortunately, there's no easy way to figure this out. A, you can rely on another photographer to help you, which would be fantastic. And B, you have to visit those locations and find out for yourself. Now, eBird is a good starting point. So I'll often go to eBird. Oh, yep, somebody's seen these birds here. How do I know if I can get good photos here? Well, often you have to visit that location for yourself. I did that recently. I went to a lake that I've never been to before. There'd been reports of ducks and swans and things there. So I've gone there myself and I quickly realized that I was never going to get a good photo here. These birds were somewhat wild. The water level was low. The birds were far out. I've gone for a bit of a wander walking over the lake bed and I knew I was never going to get a shot. It was just a waste of time. These birds were just going to move away. I was never going to get close. Now, if you go to a town park, for example, where the birds are used to humans and there's birds there, 
you get down low, you're almost guaranteed to get photos. So I will go back to these spots over and over again where I know I can get shots because I know the birds are tolerable of humans or the type of shots I can get um, are very, very good. Okay, so the very last mistake I want to share with you is the misbelief that you need some sort of talent or you need some sort of background in photography to get good shots or to even enjoy wildlife photography. It can be further from the truth. I'm probably the least creative person I know. I had zero experience with photography and I didn't even know what a bird was before I started. But with a bit of perseverance, a bit of patience and just the enjoyment and the joy I get from it, I've now put in the time and I can now take shots that I'm very happy with and I'm happy to share that with you now. And I'm confident that if you put in the time, anything can be achieved. I 100% believe that. And I encourage you to uh, get out there now armed with this knowledge. You're gonna go out there and enjoy wildlife photography as much as I do. So I really do wish you all the best for your wildlife photography. I hope this video was helpful. I'd love to hear what your mistakes you, that you've made in the comments so we can all learn from those. If you like this content, obviously give it a big thumbs up. Let's YouTube know that my video is worth watching. Thanks to all the new subscribers that have been joining the channel. Thanks to all the new members. If you're not aware, for less than the price of a coffee per month, you can directly support the channel. You get a cool little bird next to your name. Or if you are enjoying the content, you can make that one-off donation via the super thanks button. And I really do appreciate that. So until the next video, take care. Happy birding. See you later. A silhouette shot I got of a pair of albatross just flying in the sky. So these albatross flying in the sky. So these albatross flying in the sky. So these albatross flying in the sky with a beautiful coloured background.